good morning. <laughs> so happy to see your faces this wonderful Friday morning. Um, but welcome to our program, Housing While Black, supporting staff of color through social unrest. I'm with Mary Mary Leather, I'm an assistant director at University Housing at Florida State. And my name is Shanta Lawrence, I'm the director of Florida and Student Experience, also at Florida State. One person we do want to acknowledge who is not here, her name is Brittany Philbert. Um, she's an assistant director at UNCG, UNC Wilmington, excuse me. Um, and she was a part of this presentation with us. She just wasn't able to travel, but we want to make sure that you all know um, that she is with us in this as well. So just a quick brief outline of what our goals are today in terms of how the flow of this conversation will go. We'll identify a few learning outcomes. We hope that you will be able to get from this. Um, we're going to do some acknowledgments um, as this is a very relevant topic that has continued to evolve since we first worked on this presentation. Um, and with that acknowledgement will come some relevancy in terms of why we're choosing to talk about this topic today. We're also going to share with you some research, well, a research study and the results of that study that we did with some campus colleagues last summer and share with you some information that came directly from our colleagues and your peers that might help inform the work that you're doing on your campuses, as well as explore some strategies or ways that we can work together to support staff when we're dealing with these types of issues on our campus and quite frankly, in our country. So in terms of learning outcomes, definitely want to talk about some recent issues or um, events that have taken place um, in terms of social unrest. Um, when we talk about social unrest, we're definitely talking about events where people may have been triggered by specific things that have occurred either directly or indirectly. So when you hear us say social unrest, um, we are speaking specifically to that. Perhaps um, events that have led to protests or different types of movements, things of that nature. Thus, our hashtag um, t-shirts um, last summer is when we first started working on this presentation. Um, and it was the spirit of hashtags and this concept that it, hashtags were leading to acknowledgement of lots of social unrest that were happening, particularly last summer, but certainly have also continued as well. Um, if four experiences again of um, our Black colleagues, um, you will note that this um, session is titled Housing While Black. It is not our desire to not be inclusive, um, but at the time that we were presenting, um, working on this presentation, there were some very specific events happening as it relates to Black people in this country. And so housing while Black is a very intentional term. It is not meant um, not to acknowledge other, um, other identities and things of that nature, but just in terms of context. Um, the information that we'll be sharing from our study is specifically from Black, black <coughs> audience. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about racial bath fatigue. It's a real thing. Um, last mm -hmm. summer, it was a real, real thing. Um, and it continues to be a thing. Um, even beyond racial bath fatigue, um, compassionate fatigue is maybe also another term that you've heard a lot about, which unfortunately many of our students as well as staff are dealing with. Um, and then lastly, our goal will be to identify some strategies. And our plan is to leave some time again for us to have some open dialogue and conversations about perhaps things that you're doing on your campuses or feedback that you've heard from your staff of color as it relates to the type of support that they may need when we think about these different issues that have been going on, particularly in the, in the past year. Awesome. So one thing is I like to get everybody in a space. Um, there are some things that we just need to acknowledge about what's present. One, as Sharon mentioned before, we did do this last summer and we did it at a Kumo Live two days prior to, well, four days prior to us getting, giving this presentation. There were two more shootings that happened in the country. Very raw and we wanted to make sure that everybody, because everybody's mind was in different places. And so when you come in here, you're like, okay, this is the title. I'm, I'm coming here to get something. But we do want to acknowledge that sometimes there is pain, hurt, confusion in a space. But there's also a desire to heal and a desire for us to do better. And so we want to acknowledge those things here. Um, through this, there, we're going to see pictures and those sorts of things. And if you are triggered, we also want to be to acknowledge those things too. There are some images. Um, as we were going through to revise, I was, as I was looking for stuff, I was like, I'm being triggered again. But I had to acknowledge that for myself so we could continue to move forward. Um, some other things too um, with this is that we acknowledge the package that this message is coming from. We are two black women who are telling a group of individuals this is 
this is the story. And so we acknowledge that because that also affects how it is received. Um, so we wanted to make that present here as well. The other thing is we also wanted to know why you chose this session. So you want some questions? Volunteers. <laughs> awesome. So, why did you come to this session? Um, so, I work on a township with 14 and I'm also going to identify with a racial and ethnic minority. So, I want to know how to best support them and my supervisor as well. Awesome. I decided to come to this um, session just because it's coming from undergrad. I love um, starting in undergrad. Um, I'm sorry if this comes off as wrong, but I was kind of the only. Um, so it's something that I've been working through as I go up um, into my career and into my grad work. I was also the only. So it's something that I've always needed like that support. Um, at my current institution, I do have that support and I do have people that are willing to have those conversations. So I'm wanting to be that one person that somebody else can have to have that support because I didn't have that support until currently. Awesome. Yes. I just started using Charlotte on August 1st. And we had um, a social with people on Scott was um, shot and killed right after I got there. And it was right after school opened, and so we had protests for five days in the city. And our campus was on lockdown. I I've been very used to working to support professional staff and student staff when things have happened, but that was a whole different level. Um, and so I want to be more hyper aware of what I need to do to really support staff. Awesome. I have a team of 18 professionals that, that I oversee, and I can't. I can't ignore what's going on in our city and on our campus that like it doesn't affect them or me. And I want them, no matter how long they're they're within my university, for them to have a very successful, meaningful experience when they know that they're supported. Awesome. I'll take one more and then we'll go ahead and move on. I want to learn more about how to better support staff outside of me and what my feelings are, because sometimes we get stuck in that place of what we feel instead of what's best for other people and us as a whole. So I want to learn how to move forward as a group. Awesome. Thank you all of you for that. Our hope is that you get that um, from this discussion. And of course, we are always available afterwards to have these as well. This is an ongoing project for us. And so we're happy to share. We one of the other acknowledgments that I'll say this time is that we're also not experts. You heard what Aaron say earlier, that if you can't tell, we're also black women, which means that we get in our feelings as well about <laughs> some of the things that have happened. And so this is very much a personal reflection as well in terms of our attempt just to start this dialogue and this conversation because for many people, <coughs> this is a hard conversation to have. What we found at Akuho when we asked the same question is that we had lots of people in the room who did not identify as black, but said very much what many of you have said, I supervise staff that I don't know how to relate or I don't know the right things to say or concern that I'll say this and it'll lead to that. And so know that we are all working through this journey together. And so I want to give that acknowledgement. We are not trained in terms of how to deal with these types of things. I don't think our country is trained with how to deal with all the things that have happened. And so we are all learning as we go. And we really just think that this is an important enough topic to be having it in this space because again, many of us are dealing with this very directly. And as Terry said, it's only our very own cities and um, campuses throughout. So how did we get here? Um, as we said, we started this discussion in summer 2016 um, when it was very much at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there were repeated incidents of violence that was happening, particularly at that time, um, toward Black men who were losing their lives at the hands of police. Um, many of you will probably recall that that led to lots of tension in this country, um, very much people taking sides. Um, there were lots of other movements that came in response to the Black Lives Movement. Um, all of a sudden, all lives started mattering, which became even more triggering for people who were the victims of the violence that was happening at that time. Um, as LaFerrin said, we were working on this presentation. Um, I had already gotten into Akuho Eye and like literally, I think Dallas had happened right before that. And so we found ourselves literally in the process of trying to modify this presentation to deal with the reality that since we had done it, there had been more things that had happened. And so even when we were talking about this, we were like, the sad part is, is that it seems like this has become the norm, that we have to continue to modify and add to the next thing that has happened to the point that it really has become almost every day. And what does that say and what does that mean when we move past the point of being triggered to like, it's another day, it's another hashtag. 
and then the, the hashtag t-shirts. So a little thing called our presidential election happened in the fall of last year. Um, and I think that regardless of where people stood in terms of their candidates of choice, um, undoubtedly came from that. Lots of emotions that people had around the lead up to the election and the election itself, and certainly post election. Um, there have been protests that have happened on campuses in many state capitals all across this country directly related to the presidential election. Once we got past the presidential election, we had the inauguration, and then we started having executive orders. And executive orders have continued to lead to some forms of social unrest. And by the fall, protests and movements that are happening across the country with people trying to vocalize and deal with feelings of oppression and things of that nature. Um, most recently, as we all know, we are in the process of dealing with changes in immigration statuses, changes in transgender bathroom pieces that directly impact our students. Um, we have lots of students, particularly our DACA students, who are very concerned about their safety, their lives. We have students who while themselves are US born citizens, have parents who are not, um, and are having real concerns about what that means. And all of these things are things that our students are bringing to us. And they're bringing it to us not because we can necessarily fix it, but we serve in that outlet role for lots of our students. And unfortunately, over time, this becomes a heavy burden to bear as an administrator, as someone who is supervising staff who are dealing with these issues, as someone who are dealing with students who are dealing with these issues, and then yourself trying to figure out what that means for you and you yourself may have been in a place where you are being triggered or you are even more unfortunately the victim of some of these very things that your students are dealing with. And so when we started thinking about how do we really get to this and explore this topic, this is how what led us to our research project and really wanting to hear from colleagues around the country in terms of what they were dealing with. Um, I will tell you at our campus, we have a number of staff of color um, and LaFerrin and I also self-disclose, I'm a LaFerrin supervisor. And there are times when we've had conversations about like, this is just, this isn't the day. Um, and this expectation, I think sometimes that when you are of color, people expecting that you have the answer and not realizing at times that you are carrying as much of that burden, if not even more, um, and what that looks like. So at this point, we want to lead us to talk to you a little bit about the research study that we did last summer. I want to give you some background context and then we're going to walk through the results of that particular study. So what we did last summer is we developed um, a survey instrument that we sent out and we did basically a call for black people in housing. It was that simple. Are you black, do you work in housing, will you fill out this survey? Um, and one of our forms <laughs> that we used um, was um, black staff, if people are familiar with that particular Facebook group, was a huge place for which we put it out and asked people to please take the time to fill this out as we are trying to gather information. Because again, we have personal stories and experiences, but we want to be able to share beyond just what our experiences were. And so that is how we now, um, it was a very simple survey because we know that we worked in housing in summer where busy people do not have time to spend all day filling out a survey. So it was 10 questions. Five of those questions was tell us who you are demographic. We want to understand who we're talking to. Generationally, we had some conversations about where we thought we would see differences in response. Um, so we looked at um, some of those different pieces. So demographics was part of it. Um, and then we had five what we considered to be pretty simple, open-ended questions. Tell us what you thought. Um, and then our goal as researchers, if you will, is that we took that qualitative um, data and then code it and came up with things from what people shared with us to be able to kind of fine tune some generalization in terms of things that people share. Um, again, in addition to Black Staff and Facebook, we reached out very directly to colleagues we knew in the field and asked them to share with other individuals so that we could get as much information as possible. At the end of the day, we had tons of people who indicated they were interested in the survey, um, but did not indicate in or act on actually filling out. So um, our survey, our sample size was 16 people. Um, so not necessarily tons of people, but what you see in the next slide is that we, we felt pretty good 
um, about some of the diversity that existed within the participants that chose to complete the survey. And so we're going to walk through just a minute. <coughs> In terms of the survey de demographics, the majority of the people who completed the survey were women, um, as you can see from the screen. Um, the other thing to know is that the majority of professionals were also serving at predominantly white institutions. So we did ask um, to understand the difference in terms of institution types and where people were working, understanding that that also may impact the experiences that they're having. Um, other things to know is that the majority of our participants were entry level. And so you will probably see as we're talking through some of those results where we saw some outliers in terms of some of the experiences that were shared. And we think that those, some of those things probably came from participants who were not necessarily um, entry level or identified as millennials. And then last but not least, one time for CEHO, the majority of our participants came from the CEHO region, which is not surprising at all, but we try to be intentional as well in understanding where people were located knowing that geographically where people were located would very likely also impact or have something to do with the types of experiences that they were otherwise choosing to share. So now we're going to take a minute and go through the results of the study. So one of the first questions that we asked was, we asked for participants to tell us basically how have these issues or these, um, these issues of um, unrest that have been happening, how have they affected them in terms of their personal well-being, um, be that, be that um, spiritually, psychologically, socially, physically, the general concept there was we really want to understand how these issues of, some, of social unrest have impacted you in terms of your well-being. And the things that we got or the things that we heard from people was very much negatively when it came to from a psychological perspective. Um, a number of participants there shared that it was affecting how they interacted with their peers, that there was some level of disassociation with their peers. Um, a number of people indicated that they um, had retreat to themselves, did not feel like they could have conversations with their peers. Some participants indicated that they were actually triggered by their peers. Um, and so that was really one of the things that they then said that because of that, it negatively, infect, negatively impacted their overall well-being. Um, um, a number of participants referenced um, the spiritual impact it had on them. Some actually indicated that spirituality was a way that they um, was their kind of retreat or way to deal with the issues that were happening. Um, others shared that they were having very physical impact. Um, to what was going on. Um, and again, we'll hit on that a bit when we talk about racial bath fatigue, but there was definitely a theme of people talking about the physical toll that it had taken on them in terms of just dealing with the social unrest that was happening. Um, isolation silence, again, a lot of people were like, they went into themselves, they found that it was easier for them not to have conversations and dialogue with other people, um, which was also impacting their well-being. And then the other piece that was also interesting is that lots of staff said that what happened is that it led to an increased workload. All of a sudden, they were having tons more students of color who were reaching out to them, who needed things from them, and that was also taxing to their well-being because they felt a sense of responsibility in being there and supporting those students, even though at the same time they were struggling and dealing with those issues themselves. And so one of the things that we did, um, we kind of trolled social media during this time and was very much looking at what were people's responses, not just to our survey, but at this time, what were their responses to the things that they were sharing on social media? And we did get people's permission to allow us to share any of the things that they said. And so this particular individual was talking about when I said earlier that we have participants talking about the physical toll. You see that he was sharing wanting to sleep, but being awake, thinking about being black tomorrow and what that all meant. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but really just getting to this point of giving us what we thought was a pretty good indication of the toll this was taking on people in terms of their well-being and not just being something that was um, mentally impacting them, but also even physically impacting them. I'm 
So the other part was how did it affect your attitude or approach to um, your work? Um, as we said before in the previous one, we noticed that there was that increase in workload. Um, and so if it's not only from, so for some of us in this room, depending on where you are in the chart, not only do you have students and your students, that your students, your residents in the hall, but then you have your student staff, and then you have your coordinators, your area coordinators, your assistant directors, and all of those individuals in between who are looking for space. Regardless if they are people of color or not, everybody's trying to figure out how am I supposed to respond to this? And so some attitudes towards people who work adjusted slightly. Um, and so some of them, it was like, I want to be more of an advocate. I want to get more involved with some of the things on campus um, to help my students to have more resources to figure out um, how I can one do better for myself, but also provide things for them. So it made them want to be um, more involved to some degree. Um, and so more incorporation of social justice in their halls and the work that they were doing to educate their students in the best way they could. Um, there was also some negative emotional things, particularly for those individuals who no one had said anything to them. And we'll talk about that a little later in terms of recommendations, but um, people walking around them as if something had not happened. Um, and so that was impacting how they were showing up. As Jason, the um, Facebook post before, Jason was talking about, I'm, call, I'm talking about calling in black tomorrow. Now, there have been several days in the last 18 months where I was like, I don't do this today. I don't have it to do today. Um, and then there's always somebody who is sending something like, if you need to close your door today, close your door. That Because you need to protect you too, to take care of yourself, so in order for you to take care of other people. Um, one individual in particular made it very clear that she was reconsidering working um, at predominantly white institutions after everything that was going on due to how she was um, interacting with staff and students. Um, and she was just like, I, I can't do this. I think I need to go. She was talking about going to an HBCU. She had never been, had never worked at an HBCU, but for her, she felt like that was the best place for her to be due to what she was experiencing at the time. Um, and a couple other people were like, yeah, I don't know if this is for me, because this is where I was going to do. But also this idea of searching for support, looking for somebody um, to connect with. And so this looked different for a lot of people. Um, some expressed going to um, the employee assistance program, which offers counseling services on campus. Others, um, spiritual people in their lives to talk through what was happening. Um, and so the other stuff is that they became more guarded and more cautious. Because I don't know where you stand right now with what's going on and what's happening. So now there's another wall. And I'm going to continue to build more walls to keep you from me so that we don't have these types of issues. Um, and so this came up more often than not, um, this idea of always questioning someone's motives around you because you didn't know where they stood. I will point out that we have one participant who actually said that it had no impact at all, that it did not change their approach to their work. And so when we did a little bit more digging, found that that was, that came from one of our participants that did not identify as a millennial, that was an older participant. And so we thought that was very interesting because all other things led to that. And it was like, this one person's like, nope, nothing. Messing with our data. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I program, you understand? <laughs> So the next thing is, how do you seek support on campus during or after a triggering event? Now, triggering event could be a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, and so one, some people are like, I don't seek support on campus. And that came from not feeling like there was any support on campus. Um, others <clears throat> were like, I'd rather go talk to my friends who are not here. I reach out to colleagues across the country or who are in my region or those who I've met. Um, and so that has been part of it. One thing with this in general, because as Chandra said, we were trolling social media, there was a lot of activity on Facebook, particularly in the Black Staff group. Um, we mentioned it before as that was where we sent out the survey as part of um, the process. And there was a lot, some things like, it's okay, just keep moving. It's, it's going to be all right. If you need something, you need a walk, do what you need to do. Um, so thinking about where people were looking for support when not on campus. Um, colleagues and professional peers, as I said, who, were, who weren't necessarily at their institution 
or if they happen to be the only of uh, the only um, in their department, um, looking for people elsewhere on campus who were their peers, um, their supervisor and mentor. Which this was a was in well, that's what this was our hope that you would seek your supervisor um, for some of those things. But some of them acknowledged that their supervisor was not a part of that process at all um, due to probably their relationship with that person um, or their mentor. And then of course, campus resources. Um, as I said before, our employee assistance programs and counseling services and various campuses offer those things. Um, those were some of the things that our um, re respondents said were available um, to them. But it, always, it wasn't necessarily always in their department. So the last question we asked, and this was actually a back and forth with us, is we really struggled as presenters with, when we say support, what does that mean? Um, because oftentimes, how I need to be supported is not how a parent needs to be supported, is not how a parent staff need to be supported. And so we wanted to delve a little bit more into what it meant when we said support. And so our question was really in terms of, um, how do they expect to be supported during these types of events? Because we thought that would be really interesting. Also in terms of maybe perhaps also explaining the disconnect. Um, and I say that because I think a lot of times those of us as supervisors feel like we've done a good job. We pat ourselves on the back, like we acknowledge it, we feel moving, like we're good. But is that really what staff are seeking in terms of the type of support that they may need? And so one of the things that we saw very clearly throughout in this particular answer is that Staff indicated that they needed space to talk about it, that they needed it to be acknowledged and they needed to have space to have a conversation, dialogue, to get it out, something, to admit that it was happening and give them an opportunity to discuss it. That was probably the largest thing that we got with this particular question, is that people really wanted space and an opportunity to have a conversation about what was going on. The next thing that we saw that was right after that one was that staff expected their institution to make some type of statement, have some type of response in terms of that acknowledgement. And so space was good, but many people indicated that they were expecting their institution, their division, their department of housing, they were expecting there to be some official acknowledgement, response, action plan from the institution itself. Um, next for that is that people indicated that they wanted there to be some concern for their well-being. They wanted someone to reach out, ask how they were doing, perhaps offer them some time to check in, well-being, take a day. You heard LaFerrin say earlier, um, definitely what was trending this time on social media was the concept of calling, calling in black, like taking a day, like mental health day, because it, at that point, people really like they felt like they had reached a level. But when, when staff were talking about what they were expecting support, these were the things. The last piece is that, again, as LaFerrin said, we were hoping and expecting that we would see people talk a lot about supervisors and that relationship and that really being a source of support. And what we did, we did find a few that indicated that they do absolutely have expectations of their supervisors that they expect that their supervisors are having those conversations with them, that their supervisors are the ones that are showing concern for their well-being, that it's their supervisor that is offering them campus resources and otherwise making sure that they are okay in order for them to be well enough to do the job of supporting their students. Um, any questions on any of our, these, so these were our questions and responses that we got. Um, again, as I mentioned, we went through um, and coded um, what we, um, the information we got, and we are actually planning a follow-up survey to this one. But we want to go into um, talking just briefly about the concept of racial battle fatigue. Um, during um, last summer as well, Jesse Williams, if you're a Grey's Anatomy fan, um, actually um, in the BET Awards, um, he, first of all, he is very vocal about issues, social justice issues in general, um, but made a quote, made a statement that we thought quite perfectly explained this concept of racial battle fatigue. Just because we are magic does not mean we are not real. And this concept of, um, and I would say, especially just because you're black, just because you might be a supervisor, you might be in upper administration, all those things doesn't mean that you don't have feelings and doesn't mean that you aren't carrying that with you. 
Um, one of the things that LaFerre and I would have conversations about is that at some point it's almost like you're the sponge. You're taking everybody's issues. You're taking your staff issues. You're taking your student issues. You're taking your family issues. Um, for me, I'm the aunt of two um, lovely little boys. And I spent all last summer thinking, why am I thinking about conversations to have with them about how what you should do when you get pulled over? Why am I having conversations with a six-year-old? And literally said it to my six-year-old nephew one day, like, you have to learn now how to follow instructions because you may not get a second chance later. So when TT tells you to stop, you stop now because if someone else tells you to stop, this could look different. And having those checkpoints of, why am I saying this to a six-year-old? Like, why is this important? Why is this conversation important for him to hear from me? And so this concept that we bring all of that with us to the table, this <clears throat> concept of intersectionality, I don't get to just be Chandra who works in housing. I'm Chandra, the aunt, the sister, the daughter, the friend, the colleague, the supervisor, and all those other pieces. And with that comes lots of work and a heavy burden and lots of weight. And so we thought that this quote was very appropriate when you think about the concept of racial balance of being. The other thing for this, I, I always tell people about the wall. We work in student affairs, and so we build this wall. It has nice bricks. It's pretty solid because of everything that we deal with. And you have to be to some degree, and it's horrible to say because there's always something coming next. So you build it. So here's the wall. Things happen. It's doing okay. It's taking it from getting to you. Keeps happening. Sometimes the wall doesn't have time to recover from it getting hit. So there starts to be cracks in the wall. Think you're like, wait, I'm trying to put it back up. But as soon as you put it back up, Something else hits the wall. And so when I think about this, it's the same concept. And when you are, when things are happening that are constantly going at your identities, which whatever identities you hold, that continues to happen. And we have to acknowledge for ourselves that we have to take time as supervisors, as people who are supporting individuals, we have to take time to take care of ourselves in order for us to help other people take care of other people. Because that's literally our process. We, we help other people process how they help other people. Um, and so in that, we also have to acknowledge ourselves. I think we, we put on that hard shell, you just gotta do what you gotta take it. Yeah, but you feel, um, and you don't wanna have that breakdown in the middle of the meeting. As I told Chandra last year, I said, I have not cried this much in public in my entire life, and I don't do that. Um, and she was like, I'm, mm -hmm. I was like, this has got to stop. Um, but part of that was me, for, that was something, an indicator for me that I needed to take time. If I was about to have a breakdown in the middle of a meeting or office, that means my staff was probably about to do the exact same. And so they took their key for me. So let's uh, explore just a little bit about racial advocacy and exactly what it is. Um, this is the official definition, um, but the concept really is this thought of constantly being triggered or dealing with um, physiological, cultural, or emotional coping, having to find a way to deal with the issues. And those issues could be a result of microaggressions, so things that may not even seem obvious, or it could be a result of direct racial hostility um, or being in very unsupportive environments. And so I say that to say that it does not mean that every day you walk in life that someone is calling you out of your name or um, exerting physical harm to you. That, but constant and repeated dealing with even microaggressions can lead you to a place of really being um, dealing with racial balance. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I thought it was important to clarify that because I think sometimes people think, well, if it didn't happen to me directly, then I really shouldn't have an issue with that. But that concept of microaggressions and what over time constantly and repeatedly having to deal with those things can lead you to a space of really dealing with racial battle fatigue. And so how does it show up? What does it look like? Um, basically, from a psychological standpoint, chronic worrying, always feeling like you don't know what's going on or you need to be um, concerned. A lot of people would describe racial bank, um, racial balance fatigue as um, high anxiety, having anxiety about lots of different things and issues, whether you can really make sense of why you're having that anxiety or not. Um, intrusive thoughts, 
Um, I borderline call this paranoia, even though it's not, but I'm like, everybody gets to die. Um, I don't know what you're about in life, so I'm not really sure exactly where that goes, but um, also almost kind of living in this constant state of questioning other people's intentions, um, motives when it comes to you. Difficulty concentrating. Again, um, one of the things that I was telling my parent, um, the incident that happened in um, Louisiana last summer um, with the um, with a man that was shot at the convenience store. If you recall, the next day there was a press conference, and his son spoke at the press conference. And during that con during that press conference, his son started to cry, mm -hmm. and and I would characterize it as well. During the, and I was having a conversation with a parent because at that point I was already at a go and I said to her, I literally cannot go to sleep because I keep hearing this child crying, wailing during this press conference. And literally did not, like, I was like, for the last two nights, like, I legit cannot go to sleep because I keep, this image is now in my head. And a lot of us know, especially last <clears throat> summer, there were lots of videos, there were lots of very graphic things that you could not simply unsee. And so this concept of difficulty concentrating to me is very real because when you have those images going on in your head, when you have those sounds in your head, it's hard to focus. And so to me, that, that was a very real, when, when we talk about what it looks like, it was very real. On um, the physical part, people getting headaches, people being very tired, People worrying themselves to the point that they ended up with gastrointestinal issues, ulcers, things of that nature. Um, one of the things that is prevalent in a lot of um, minority communities are things like hypertension, high blood pressure, um, those different things that in a lot of medical reports are tell you very clearly, these types of things have truly negative impact and reactions for those. And so it's not just so simple as I'm tired, it's not just so simple of I can't take this anymore, but there are real physical implications to dealing with racial battle fatigue and the health concerns that it also comes with. Whenever you do, do research on um, racial battle fatigue, you will see very much things related to racial battle fatigue, also related to compassion fatigue, and even some reports will also put it on the same level or reference them in conjunction with things like post-traumatic stress syndrome in terms of the impact that it could have physically on people. And so we thought it was really important to acknowledge that fact because sometimes we think it's just in our head. Is it just me? Am I just overreacting? Um, but the research will say that racial, racial battle fatigue is actually a very real thing. And it's often, um, particularly during times of unrest, challenges that your staff could be dealing with very directly. And so this was for my very own Ashley Gaddy Award winning CEO <laughs> member um, during this time. And she posted this um, again in our trolling of Facebook about, you know, I'm ready to hide on the covers because I'm tired. Um, for those who have to work today, I wish you strength, safety, a, fil a filter if you need to keep your job, a shield from ignorance. But what we thought was interesting was the number of people who reacted to her post. More than 160 people had some type of reaction to what Ashley had posted, um, but thought that this was a great illustration of trying to work through that point when people start talking about, I'm just at a place where I'm fatigued, I'm tired, I don't know how to deal with this. And honestly, on some level, physically, I don't want to have to deal with this at this point. So why does it matter? <laughs> Um, and um, I found this poem and I thought that this was um, really good in terms of just talking about well, black administrators, it is, it is crucially important. And it's not just exclusively for black administrators, but again, this presentation was started with black administrators in mind, so no things taken. But it is extremely important to develop skills to learn how to cope with these things when they happen. As the parents said, this concept of the wall constantly being knocked up on against you, it is, it is vitally important that you work on strategies and ways to deal with how you're going to the cold. Because for many of us, when these issues happen, it's leading to more work. So it's not leading for more time for you to deal with it yourself. It is now leading for more work for you. 
Um, some of you may have found yourselves all of a sudden tapped to be on that special committee to deal with the new thing, or all of a sudden you couldn't figure out why you were helping create this program, or asked to go to the protest, or asked to meet with a group of students who look like you for whom you might not really know, but uh, you know, we need you're just the person we need. And so, if anything, this is not going to be an opportunity for people to have more time. Um, but if anything, also not just cope with their own personal feelings about these issues, but also understand and recognize that it also may lead to additional responsibilities simply because of your racial identity. And for many of our respondents, they said that even though they felt that that was taxing, that they got more responsibilities, they felt like they had a responsibility to make sure that they were there for their students who were going through those issues. So the thing that you came here to do, how do we do this? So we, after going through all of that, we came up with two things. I thought that this was very important um, for us to quote. I love this. It says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and so with that, when we go into this concept concept of self-care. So how do we support our, st our staff, our students, um, and ourselves through this process? And so part of it is self-reflection. What do I need in this moment? What do I need to do? Um, for me, that may be, I just need to go walk. I need to close my door. I need to shut off things that are feeding me images and or messages, right? Um, the other thing is to build your coalition, your support. Um, that is, I will tell you, my colleagues that I have are amazing um, and are like, you all right? What you need? You need something? Bring me your cupcake. What you got? What you need? I got you. So tell, just tell me what you need. But also those individuals who, not, who aren't necessarily on my campus who are reaching out, particularly if it's something that has happened close in the area or something like that, just to say, I'm thinking about you. It's OK. If you need me, I'm here. Um, the other thing is to, I skipped one, advocating for yourself. Something that Chandra talked about is that as a supervisor, I feel like I'm, I'm supporting my staff, but that may not be what they need. Part of the responsibility in that is being able to vocalize what you need um, from your supervisor. Um, and some of us, I mean, because it's my supervisor, so it's going to be like, I just need that. But maybe that's, maybe I need more than that, or maybe I need to find a space on campus. Um, and that may take me away from a meeting I may need to go to or whatever, but that's the best thing that I can do so that I can be there for my staff. So having, you have to advocate for yourself um, because supervisors and supervisors in the room, the thing is you're doing what you can based on what you know. Um, and so you know how to give support based on what you know how to do. Um, and so part of that is that we have to encourage our staff to advocate for what they need. We need to vocalize that. Um, utilize the resources that are on campus. Um, I keep mentioning the employee assistance program. It is okay. And somebody, little Melissa, Melissa, she, she and I were good friends. Um, but she and I have a good conversation. What's going on with you? Yeah, this is what is happening. And I'm just glad you're here to listen to what I have to say. Um, and so um, using those things in our campus, there's this push now for just happy, healthy people, like being healthy through our counseling center for employees. And so taking advantage of some of those things that may come out on campus. And of course, minimizing assumptions. So when you walk into a space, yes, I am very cognizant of all the identities that I carry when I walk into a room that never changes. But not assuming ill intent from people in the space who don't look like me. Not everybody is out to get you. And so making sure you understand that. Some collegial support, um, acknowledgement. And so we've been saying that a lot about this acknowledgement piece. That's the other thing as well for like your, or your campus or your department. How you responded to, for example, Pulse Nightclub and how you respond to Paris, how you respond to a shooting in Baton Rouge versus how you respond to Charleston. If you don't respond or you respond differently, that also sends messages. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about that too in terms of what you choose to acknowledge um, that's going on in the country um, because that sends messages to um, those people. 
Um, as you can see, some check-ins, of course, building some meaningful relationships, because if you have meaningful relationships, it's easier for me to tell you that I'm having problems and I'm going through some things. So this concept right here, ally versus accomplice. We talk about allyship and those sorts of things. Sometimes you have to understand where you are. Some things I am an ally, other things I'm an accomplice. When I first heard it, I was like an accomplice. Accomplice would go to jail. <laughs> but then when I thought about it, it means that there's somebody who's in it with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to stand with you. What happens to you happens to me. And I'm here to support you. And it's okay if you're here and it's okay if you're there. But you need to be cognizant of where you are and don't pre perpetrate this when you're here. So this is something I do want to share um, before we wrap up. We also wanted to, uh, we have peers, of course, who didn't look like us, who were also on social media. We thought this was really important um, when we saw her response to um, what was happening and going on. So I'm going to read it. Sorry. I think I have a capture baby voice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, as a white heterosexual person navigating this crazy world, it can sometimes be hard to know what to do or say during times of unimaginable anger and hurt being felt by my friends who may identify differently than me. I get it. However, as, however, as has been pointed out to me on more than one occasion, sometimes silence can be just as hurtful, just as deafening, and some may ask how simply saying something on social media would do any good. And to say this, I say, social media is an outlet for so many and a way of sharing everything these days. And when in this space, as in any space, you feel alone in your anger and you feel disheartened when support is lacking, I think it matters a great deal. So I'm here to say, you matter. I hear you. And I'm here for whatever you need. If it's standing next to you, if it's walking behind you, or if it's simply getting out of the way so that you can be your amazingly powerful selves, then I'm here. And I'll be here as long as it takes. And so I thought this was the most powerful thing that I had seen from someone who was like, this is what I can be. You let me know, and I'm there. Um, but even the concept of saying, I can get out of your way, if that's the support that you need. And so acknowledging her role and what she knew and what she didn't know, but what she could and couldn't do. And so as I, we went through some of these, um, as well, we're running short on time. Um, as we would, we never would. I got 10 minutes. Awesome! <laughs> you gotta get better signals. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I guess it's early. Please. It's Friday. <laughs> Acknowledgement. We discussed. Um, but this also comes from, so even if your institution as a whole is not acknowledging that way, as a department, you have to figure out your response. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I think we, Chandra, and the other two assistant directors, we, like, we meet, we're like, okay, so what do we need to do? We open up space, we talk, like, is this enough? Um, and so I think part of that is also being that. The other thing in here is that it's being consistent with your response and communication. And that's what I was talking about. How you respond to a pulse needs to be equally as how you respond to a Charleston. And if not, just don't acknowledge anything. And then I'm mean, used to have problems. But at bare minimum, there's a consistent message about what is important. Um, because your institution will send out those nice blurbs, we get them often. Um, and so it is signaling to our student population what's important, but it's also signaling to staff what is important, what we value or not value as an institution. I would also add to that piece about acknowledgement is that any level of acknowledgement is better than no level of acknowledgement to a certain degree. But also knowing that you may not always get it right. I, you know, we got to a point where it's like, I'm going to send out emails every day. Like every day, there's going to be an email saying, this has happened in the world and we want And so I think we still struggle, and I would say personally myself still struggle from an institution, from a departmental standpoint in terms of how that looks. Um, and so sometimes that's what that looks like personal reach out. Like maybe I'm not sending an email to the entire staff, maybe I'm calling specific staff. 
um, to follow up. Um, we had meetings that have happened that I knew that I had staff that had family from a particular place where it was happening. And so just know that any acknowledgement is certainly what participants of our study will say is appreciated. This enhanced intercultural training. Um, some things that came out, particularly over the last 18 months, is staff acknowledging where they where they weren't. Right. They're not. But where things that they were not extremely astute in, um, particularly when it came to diversity and community issues. And I was like, that's great, because that helps us figure out what's the best thing to do and resources to provide um, in order for those individuals to be able to have conversations with their students. Um, which makes those relationships that they're trying to build more genuine. Because um, sometimes it's that, are you only talking to me when bad things happen? Because if you're only talking to me when bad things happen, this isn't genuine, you can just hear. Um, versus, I have a relationship with you, I want to know, I want to understand, um, but also understanding how to truly be in the space with the student, even if you may not fully understand or relate to what is happening, but you know that hurt, you know hurt. Everybody knows what hurt feels like. Um, and if, if that is the one thing, you know that somebody may need you. Of course, assessing your culture of your apartment, is this a safe space? Some people are like, I'm the only person here and I don't know, I don't know what safe looks like in this particular department, X, Y, Z. And so for some departments, it's doing that assessment and really taking a mirror and being like, okay, where are we? And what messages are we sending to our staff and to our students? I don't know how much time we have left, but we will love. We love to take five minutes of those seven minutes that we have remaining. <laughs> See if there's anybody who wants to share kind of how things have looked on your campus. If people are doing great things on your campus, I know one of those people who love the conference, the conferences to hear what are other people doing um, to give some ideas about maybe more they can be doing in terms of supporting your staff of color. And again, we acknowledge that there are various issues that are going on that are marginalizing lots of people and different identities, but things that people are doing on your campus that you feel like are really working for your staff in these kinds of situations. Question. So a lot of like it's a question of how is it looking like it's it is chill. And I and I've always um been told to be that weird way it kind of well you kind of pass over, but as you know, if it passes over that means it kind of manifests itself in different ways. Um and as far as the acknowledgement piece, I do acknowledge that um a lot of race issues that came up on so I can it wasn't my personal experience. So I myself I'm trying to do better as far as Putting that, getting that out of my blind spot. Um, but as far as what I have noticed, um, we've had that we've done some a couple of things around diversity as far as showing um, um, there's a campus wide program around um, if we talk to talk to our community. Um, I mean, there's been conversations about it, but there's been um, increasing demand to have more and deeper conversations. So we're kind of scratching the surface and people kind of leave. And, and so we're trying to um, also look at other affairs and trying to. Kind of push a lot more for like that, and really trying to dig deep. And instead of um, us being in a space together, interacting with each other, we're really dig deep into what what are you feeling? I need to understand that I am feeling. I need you to understand that I'm feeling. I need to acknowledge that I am feeling. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. I think that I am specifically done a really good job trying to support our students last year. So I'm the only. So last year we took down the safe flag. The students you know got the safe flag down. Um, so that was interesting in being there and supporting them. But I want to know how do we assess how we're taking care of our people in our department? Because that's a really difficult conversation to have sometimes. Um, I was the only person of color professional staff in Res Learning last year, and then we got two new professional staff of color, and I have all the graduate students, so all the CAs, grad students, everybody comes to me, and I'm a new professional myself, I'm like, whoa, what do I do with this? So I don't want to show the mirror, right, in their face and say, hey, we need to do better, so how do I constructively assess to say, these are areas, because when I come to the table, I want to come with facts instead of my own personal biases. 
I think part of that too is just having some open dialogue with your supervisor that you feel comfortable with to talk about to talk about that. Um, because that helps you with that. Can we do some assessment? Can we do some professional development around insert topic here? Um, so that because we, we do some internal assessments well, around what our staff need. Um, based on like a pulse check about where we are. But part of that started with a conversation. Uh, another resource is Scott Factor does a racial climate survey. So if you, it used to be EBI, now Scott Factor, I still call it EBI, whatever. Um, but they, they do a racial climate survey that might be an assessment tool that's working that's been <coughs> suggesting that you're doing. And I have a follow-up. Because I did that. So um, it's interesting because our director has like four different roles on campus. So he does a lot. Um, so, how do you have the conversation in house um, when you try to have a conversation on multiple occasions? You say, you know, this is what we're hearing. We have this. And then in that administration level, they don't want to have the conversation. So, how do we push? Past that. So because we are really getting the time, I'm going to offer this, but we'll stay up here late if you want to have this okay. conversation more directly. Sometimes we have to look at what is our sphere of influence mm -hmm. and start there. And that may not mean that you may never get to the top, but what can you do? And that may need to be your starting point and your goal versus trying to move them out there. One more question, and then I know we have to go to the so I said earlier, like when you are a, a supervisor, I'm a community director. So entry level, but when things like this happen, um, I was sitting there online one day and my mentee, <clears throat> excuse me, my mentee actually inboxed me. It was like one, two o'clock in the morning. Uh she didn't want to ask me, you know, she asked me, she said, How are you doing? She said, because I can't do anything for you, but I can at least provide a cure for you if you want to uh talk about it. And so it's like if, if you're a supervisor and you are an ally, if you're not really understanding what's going on, just please just acknowledge the fact that something is going on because you know we yeah, have staff meetings and things like this going on, and we completely should have people of color that are in the room that may be feeling something, going through something. When we talk about RSA and RHA events and, and you know other events, but we don't talk about what's really going on. So when we bring it up, when I brought it up. It was like, well, you know, we can't really do anything in the department. What do you do in the building? So, but my thing is this: I'm, I take full responsibility for what happens in the building. But as supervisor, take full responsibility of what your job as a supervisor is, and the money that you're being paid to do is to supervise and supervise those folks that are of color. So, acknowledge the fact when something is going on, pick up the phone and call and say, "Hey, are you okay? Do you know you want to go out to lunch and just talk about what's going on?" Don't always pass that blame or pass that buck back off to the person who may be below you. Acknowledge what you can do as a supervisor. Again, we're going to stay up here afterwards, so people want to continue the dialogue, even though I think there might be another session after this one. I'm not sure. Okay, so we have to. Okay. So, real quick, y'all, can we please thank them for it?